You're listening to the Hour of History podcast with your host Stephen Borman and producer James Orbel. Your Hour of History begins right now. Healing, and my partner is Stephen Bauman, and today we're talking about Bacardi, rum, booze, alcohol, any of it you want to call it, the good stuff, the poison, all of it. It is the most influential drink in human history, and what's it all about? Why do we care about it besides that it gets us drunk and sometimes it tastes good? Why? It's important. It's influenced every aspect of human history. To kick things off, however, we're going to focus first on perhaps one of the more famous brands of alcohol. Steve? Yeah, we're going to talk about Bacardi. And we're going to talk about Bacardi in terms of the uh, important impact it's had, not only on the nation which it lays claim to, Cuba, but also the nation uh, in which it currently resides, Bermuda. I bet you didn't know that. Most people dun, dun, dun. I'm just kidding. Bacardi is now a massive multinational corporation that resides in Europe, North America, all over the place. But it has its original home in Cuba. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, communism and the Cold War uh, got in the way of imbibing the good stuff. Right. So, first of all, what uh, rum. Uh, rum is a spirit. It's a spirit that is uh, typically made in the Caribbean because its base is sugar. Sugar, sugar cane. Uh, mm-hmm. And, and uh, anyway, let's, let's get straight to the start of Bacardi and sort of unpack. We're going to trace the tra- timeline very uh, briefly, give you a general overview. I've picked out two books in, that offer very different perspectives on the history of Bacardi. And from that, we'll sort of re- revamp some of those key events and then talk about a couple topics, uh, globalization and the economy of these multinationals. All right. So Bacardi, first founded in 1862 by a guy with this great name. This is awesome. I'm gonna name my child this. Don Facundo Bacardi Masso. And it's great because all the Bacardis, like if you look at the family tree from uh, Don Bacardi, you go down and down and down. Every Bacardi has Facundo in their name. Facundo. So it does. It, it doesn't make. <laughs> what, what does Facundo mean in Spanish? I, I don't. I don't even know. Is it just, okay. It's just well. Name. Well, all it's right. interesting because the Bacardis are actually a Catalan family. Oh. So you know we were talking about Catalonian independence. Catalonia is everywhere these days. Mm-hmm. And in 1862, as you might know, Cuba was a colony of. Spain. So it was part of the Spanish Empire. So people from Catalonia, people from uh, Asturias, any part of Spain really could go to Cuba. And it was sort of like this new world opportunity. And the Bacardi family was one of them. They landed in Santiago de Cuba and they decided to start under Don Bacardi. They decided to start this rum company. Dun, dun, dun. It's smooth. It's light. It is the famous Bacardi rum that we all know. However... In 1888, they get a special dispensation. Bacardi is now termed to be the official purveyors of rum to the Spanish household, right? This is to the royal Spanish household. This means that they give their rum to the king and queen, right? Not just anybody can give their rum to the king and queen, only Bacardi. They get the official royal stamp of approval. But, but you just hold your horses there for a second, uh, Matthias. In 1888, aren't we very close to this like Spanish-American war? It's we a- are. We're getting um, 10 years out from the Spanish-American war, right? Teddy Roosevelt does like the charge up the hill, the Rough Riders, yellow journalism. Fake news of its day. Oh, wow. Fake news even back then. It, it's kind of really amazing to sort of think that at this time when Cuba was going through the revolutionary uh, stages, they had had a 10 years war just 20 years before this. Um, Bacardi is sort of creating this enterprise in, in what is a city in the the southeast of Cuba and, and creating this brand that eventually becomes what it is today, you know, a world famous, famous, uh, widely consumed brand. So anyway, 
I mean, we we could we could dwell on these 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 facts forever. Uh, Cuban g gets its independence from Spain in 1902 uh, with the aid of the United States, and uh, and we and then of course though Cuba remains sort of this kind of de facto client state of the United States. Um, up until the 1950s, 1960s. Well, yeah, exactly. And, and the U.S. influence lasts for a very long time. The Platt Amendment, which sort of says that the U.S. can essentially invade Cuba if there's ever political instability, is in effect until the 1930s. Which is interesting because um, Bacardi opens its big, giant Bacardi Art Deco building that's still there in Havana in 1930. But already by the 1930s, Bacardi starts establishing facilities elsewhere. So they start building facilities in Mexico, Puerto Rico. But this is important because this is sort of the birth of kind of this global alcohol trade where Bacardi really gets its chance to get big because of Cuba's sort of client protectionist status under the United States. Right, and this is how Bacardi gets famous. Ernest Hemingway, mm -hmm. all the fat cat American tourists, they go down for the cigars, they go down for the rum in Cuba. Yeah. And Bacardi becomes it, like, you know, just instantly synonymous with sort of like the good island life, this kind of bohemian, rich Caribbean paradise that people associate even to this day with like Havana cigars, you know, the Bahamas. Bacardi becomes intimately wrapped up with this. That sounds like uh, some sort of like Orientalism, except. But Cuba's so close K to Florida. K Caribbeanism. Caribbeanism. Well, yeah, I mean, it's it's like, it's the good life, it's the exotic life, but it's right next door, right? So this is why it's great for the nouveau riche in America, the 1920s, even into the 1930s, even with the Depression, right? The 40s, Cuba is seen as sort of, you know, the good life, just a plane ride away, right? You can go there, get drunk, right? Sow your wild oats, for lack of a better word, or, ugh, excuse me, and then come back and, and you know, and it's great. And Bacardi realizes they have a massive business opportunity, right? So they start to expand, right? They start to realize the potential of sort of a global alcohol brand. Because before this, most people, right, alcohol is very regional. It's very local. You know, maybe somebody in your neighborhood brews their own beer. Maybe somebody distills their own, own their own liquor. And out of the 1920s, right, coming out of the era of prohibition, there's a massive boom in America for alcohol. And and especially before, Bacardi really gets the foothold because during uh, Prohibition, anyone who's in Florida and New York is, is very close to Cuba and they can go down to Cuba and that's sort of when Bacardi establishes itself in the, in the 20s and also through smuggling. They're very close to New Orleans, very close to Miami. They can kind of get liquor in under, under the view of the United States. In fact, in the 1930s, there was a New York State Supreme Court case that said a Bacardi cocktail must be made with Bacardi rum because in New York City, <laughs> the bar keeps were just giving the house rum and calling it a Bacardi cocktail because Bacardi had sort of entered American English just like Kleenex. Has. As, as synonymous with rum itself, if which you, is actually very dangerous for your brand. You think it's good to have your brand name be synonymous with the product, but actually not because then people don't actually bother to buy your brand. As you said, Kleenex. People buy paper tissues all the time. And just call it. And a call Kleenex. it a Kleenex. However, it's probably multiple other brands. And, and this, where Bacardi is sort of making a legal challenge, this is a theme throughout the history of this organization. When something goes wrong, they go to the law, they sue the pants off whoever is offending them, and they tend to win. In fact, later, in 1956, Castro starts the march towards revolution. He takes southern Cuba, he takes the Sierra Maestra, which is where Bacardi is located. By 1958, Bacardi has already opened its new distillery in Catano, named it the Cathedral of Rum, Catano being <laughs> in Puerto Rico. And I, Matthias, was lucky enough in the year, oh, no. yes, in the year 2007, <laughs> I went to the Cathedral of Rum and, you know, it's, it's it been made into a giant museum. There's, you get your free daiquiri, your free Cuba Libre when you, when you go to it. Really? Um, and they certainly push a very distinct version of Cuban history. But we'll get back to that. <laughs> so so uh, Bacardi leaves in 1958 and Castro takes Havana in 1959. 
And yet Bacardi still retains its commercial appeal. Bacardi was so successful before the revolution in making itself synonymous with sort of this Caribbean good lifestyle that they expand operations into the United States, Mexico, Puerto Rico, Spain, and the Bahamas. And so Bacardi, even though it starts out in Cuba, is able to expand its, its operations and not lose its regional sort of brand power which is really quite something because most liquors that we know of by name have such regional identities. Jägermeister, mm -hmm. Germany, or we think of Pilsen beer, Pilsner that, that derives from Pilsen in, you know, what is now today the Czech Republic, or we think of whiskey, we think of Kentucky, you know, bourbon, right? We have alcohol as such a regional identity. But Bacardi shows that you can lose that true identity and yet if people still think of it enough, if they still have associated your brand with that identity, it doesn't matter. Which this also goes to show that Bacardi is not just important in terms of their product, but in terms of the history of branding and the history of sort of advertising and sort of consumer consciousness itself. Yes, it is certainly an excellent case study for the way in which corporations intermingle and, and how Bacardi sort of, because of their heritage as a Cuban rum, despite the fact... Authentic Cuban that rum that is no longer brewed and or distilled, and, I mean... And we're talking in, in the 50s, or even in the 30s when they were opening places in Mexico. So um, it, it's very interesting, and, and they're a really nice case study as far as, as making that image, making that association. So in, in 1965, just a few short years after the revolution, the U.S. has already declared an embargo, which is sort of uh, some big players in the embargo actually are um, former Bacardi executives. Would you <laughs> believe it? Um, anyway, by 1965, Bacardi's moving its operations from the Bahamas to Bermuda. And as you might know, Bermuda being a colony of uh, the United Kingdom is a tax haven. Uh, this, so, so these <laughs> still Panama Papers, the Paradise Papers, right. perennial problem. It was always going to come up, and and so we're talking now. In case you haven't been paying attention to the news about the Paradise Papers that are sort of indicting people, massive leak of documents related to tax havens and um, sort, sort of the rich yeah. and powerful that take advantage of them. From Canada's golden boy to the Queen of England. To Bono. Bono. Who would have Bono been? Bono himself, the Queen of England, right? But it shows, though, that Bacardi is intertwined in the same process, right? Mm -hmm. They themselves are right at the heart of this of this 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 process of tax evasion and tax evasion. And they, it's, yeah, they're good capitalists. And it, and it clashes with Castro. And really, in the 1960s on, begins a, a war between Bacardi and... The folks who left Cuba, the um, folks in, in favor of a capitalist Cuba, and the remaining Cubans. In fact, um, Che Guevara becomes sort of the, the, the old, you know, he's in charge of all the production of rum uh, shortly after the revolution. And, uh, you know, so so we this is where we get the divergent stories. So so there's one <laughs> like sort of famous book biography of Bacardi called Bi Bacardi and the Long Fight for Cuba, and uh, it, this is a like sort of journalistic history that uh, is really closely intertwined with the Bacardi family, and from this perspective, you can really see the push towards. Bacardi fighting for this image of Cuba has been stolen from the Cubans. Castro has taken what is ours. And uh, you can see the intermingling between government and the Bacardis. But this also shows the influence and power of commercial interests and government policy, right? I think we always think of like the perennial problem of lobbying and changing the rules, but it goes even beyond that to questions of, of foreign policy, not just sort of, you know, esoteric tax law or sort of designations of like, oh, this or that kind of drug policy, as we think of a lot with lobbying in the United States, but lobbying itself affects foreign policy absolutely and I know a perfect case study that that exhibits this point so but, but who would have thought that Bacardi rum of, of all the crazy <laughs> things in the world it's would be point. lobbying the United States government <laughs> to basically set up military operations and blockades against Castro and Che's Cuba and and let's let's like take a second to think about this and unpack it a little bit um, 
So, so the U.S. also has an interest in getting rid of Castro at this point. They're, the satellite state of the Soviet Union, the fear of a satellite state in the Soviet Union, at a point when the world is really afraid, absolutely afraid, of wiping itself off the face of the earth, ending humanity. This is a serious concern for the world. And, and so the U.S. politicians, it's not that these people are automatically corrupt. You know, the, the U.S. politicians are bad people or whatnot. They're honestly worried for the future of the world. And they have this corporation, Bacardi, who's willing to offer an alternative in which they have a bit more control. And if you can get some money on the side, everybody uh, wins. People love money. And an excellent case of where this sort of goes, uh, it becomes an international issue, is the case of Havana Club. So Havana Club is is uh, sort of Fidel Castro's answer to Bacardi. Um, the, all the Bacardi uh, distilleries are nationalized. And Havana Club uh, becomes the government-owned brand. Communist Rum. Communist rum. Havana Club. The problem is Havana Club was already owned by a guy named Ramon Arecabla. And he didn't have any problem with getting rid of the name. In fact, after the Communist Revolution, he moved to New York and, and he was done with the rum business. He just wanted to go about his life. The Bacardis were not on board with this. In fact, they wanted him to keep the name Havana Club so Fidel Castro couldn't create a competing rum company. Now the problem is, in 1973, Havana Club begins to export its product. So this Cuban rum teams up with a French conglomerate. They decide to sell it in Europe, in Canada, and so Bacardi now has competition. I know, and it's not just that Bacardi is this sort of noble, like, oh, the dream of the old Cuba under, you know, Batista, and da, da, da. It's also that they realize, in one of these weird ironies of history, that this communist-backed rum is going to be their major global competitor in the spirit business. And if you think about it for a second, how many rums can you name? Everyone could go Bacardi, right? Bacardi. Here. Bacardi 151. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, right, but yeah, I mean, we think of rum and we think of pirates, but nobody really knows the brand name. Maybe, yeah. Maybe B B Bacardi. Admiral Nelson's if you're still in college. Oh, dude. Super cheap, disgusting. God. But you're right. Bacardi is, has this name recognition, this sort of special kind of brand recognition where everyone knows that there's lots of rum, but the good rum is the Bacardi rum. Yeah. And so this is a threat. And this weird irony. The communist backed rum is the biggest global threat to their business. And, and what's interesting about this Havana Club, Bacardi sort of like face off is, is the Cuba brand is sort of faded after the communist revolution and Bacardi downplayed it a little bit. Bacardi wasn't pasting on the labels, this is the rum of Cuba at the time. No, Bacardi was playing much more, Bacardi is perfect with a Coke. Bacardi is perfect in a daiquiri, but but they weren't. It, Cuba was not popular. No, no, and even today, if you look at a bottle of Bacardi, what does it say on the bottle? Puerto Rican rum. No mention of Cuba. Absolutely no mention. It says established in 1862, Puerto Rican rum. If you didn't know anything about Bacardi, you would think it's something from Puerto Rico. The 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 interesting thing though is as we've already mentioned it you know it's 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 a rum that's made in collaboration with a lot of different nations it's not like the whole thing is being produced in Puerto Rico either way what happens is with this Havana Club versus Bacardi is is we have a global war between a French combination with the Cubans and uh, Bacardi, which is, as we've said, a multinational, fighting for this Havana Club brand. And uh, it, this case goes to court, as you might imagine. And, and what happens is the problem is the United States doesn't recognize Cuba as a legitimate government. And saying it's a non-legitimate government, it's not going to recognize their trademarking on the Havana Club brand. Dun, dun, dun. So, <laughs> exactly. So the problem is 
that if if we don't recognize it, then how can you sell it? it it's not going to be a marketable product. So Bacardi argues that it can't be sold in the United States. Around the time of Jimmy Carter, there's some talk of Havana Club coming to the United States. It's already in uh, Canada, and at the same time, similar rulings happen in Europe, in which Europe decides Havana Club to be a legitimate brand. So Havana Club is being sold in Europe, it's being sold in the United States, and uh, Bacardi's sort of, sort of at a loss. But, so what they do is they uh, start to work on Congress, and they start to work with lobbying organizations. One of the biggest groups that uh, Bacardi works with is the Cuban American National Foundation. Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio. Big time. We're talking big time politics here. And there's a book out called uh, Bacardi, The Hidden War. Now, this is not the story that Bacardi wants wants the world to be reading. No, not at all. And and it sort of uh, unpacks this Cuban American National Foundation. It, it claims it to be a, a far extreme right wing organization, um, and and it explains the academic infiltration that happens. Now, listen to this: the Cuban American National Foundation creates the Endowment for Cuban Studies in the 1980s, whose main objective is to produce documents of political analysis and to encourage activities concerning Cuba in academic centers. Now they put these academic centers at the University of Miami and try to get into the Florida International University as well. So through this sort of like political organization with these donors, these uh, Cuban Americans who have made it big, uh, they established basically a whole academic department uh, towards finding finding Cuba to be in the wrong. And so whenever you drink Bacardi rum, you are not just drinking rum, you're taking part in this weird sort of messy globalized power structure of a rum company founded in Cuba, but now has, has like distribution to distilleries all over the world, pushing an economic blockade through Congress, through the U.S. government, and through academic centers in the United States, and through lobbying groups to create a blockade on Cuba to prevent native Cuban rum from being from competing with their own brand. It's really quite stunning. Yeah. Um, and some of these people who are on the advisory board of the Cuban American National Foundation. J. Pepin Bosch, who is the president of Bacardi. Gene Kirkpatrick, who is, I think, the national security advisor under Ronald Reagan yes. for a time. Um, uh, Dougherty, w. Dougherty, P. Grace. Um, these are members who are who are members of the American Federation of Labor. And lo and behold, who else? Roger Stone no, no, it's, of, <laughs> of infamous Donald Trump fame. It's not on there. It's not on there. But Paul Manafort is and awesome. also. And Paul Manafort is also on the board of the Cuban American National Foundation. And this is just, just quite that, a stunning let that, thing. Let that seek in think about second. this. And it's interesting, as I think, as as historians, if you think about it, so we think of like, well, Trump just came out of nowhere. These people just sort of came out of the woodwork. But they were people. I'm People like Paul Manafort and Roger Stone, as we've seen through through this, their influence on the Cuban American National Foundation and its links with Bacardi, have deep roots in long-standing American policies of economic competition and global capitalism. And so Bacardi is not just another rum. Bacardi is a case example of the craziness of this globalized capitalist world in which we live in today. And and th I mean this is so. It's just so far removed from the pictures and the images that like, you know, it, it's been popularized lately by Dos Equis, the, you know, the most interesting man in the world. And, and, and we have, we have these sort of like depictions of, of an idyllic Cuban life before Castro or whatnot. We're now, just to be clear, Matthias and I are not saying uh, we're not endorsing the Cuban regime by any stretch of the imagination. Simply, what we're doing is tracing tracing this line of 
interactions between some very powerful, some very wealthy people who have some very, very heavy interests, financial interests, based on this rum. So it's not that simple. You go back to the history of Bacardi in the 30s, and, and while they're still based in Cuba, they're, they're sort of between Batista, who's, who's, Batista himself doesn't know if he wants to be a dictator in the, in the form of Francisco Franco, or if he wants to work for the communists. In fact, Batista legalizes the same communists that end up kicking him out. He just wants power. Exactly. Also, clarification everyone, it was not Roger Stone, it is Richard Stone. <laughs> However, it's also just as bad. Richard Stone was a Republican <laughs> senator for Florida. So this also is totally wrapped up in the power structure of Florida politics. Yes, and in, in fact, um, I am I, I'm struggling to remember here but I, I, Jeb Bush, oh, the Jeb, Jeb Bush, Bush, comes into play later in the uh, Havana Club struggle. So when Bacardi is sort of fighting over who owns the Havana Club trademark and there's some other issues, um, Jeb Bush is the governor of Florida. And you don't sort of survive Florida politics without involving yourself at some level or other with the Cuban American community and therefore the Bacardi. And with the Bacardis. And it gets really interesting too because um, Florida politics also gets very wrapped up with the cocaine trade yeah. and with cocaine politics and you have many other um, sort of what we would think of as right-wing political groups um, from Central America who petitioned the government, particularly under Reagan, to back, you know, the very, you know, the sort of dark and dastardly Contras. It was in the political imagination, the Contras fighting against um, these left-wing groups in Central America in the 1980s. However, how do the Contras fund themselves by and large outside of American backing is through the cocaine trade. Mm -hmm. And so you have this weird nexus of Republican politics, big money lobbying, anti-communism, CIA, um, and also sort of an implicit kind of backing of the cocaine trade in terms of as like, well, we're backing this Contras. And whatever they're doing sort of in their off time when they're not fighting the communists in Nicaragua is like not not our business. What they're doing is making cocaine. And this is this weird, dark nexus of American politics. And, and we're starting to sound a bit like conspiracy theorists. As you might, you know, saying like, oh, there's this big, dark multinational behind American politics. But, but it is written into American law. In the 1996 Helms-Burton Act, essentially the only way trade relations are going to be restored is if... Uh, restored with Cuba. What restored with Cuba is if the Cuban government first returns confiscated properties to original owners. What does that mean? Yeah, so you go back to the Cuban Revolution. Shortly after the Cuban Revolution, uh, private property is confiscated in favor of the government, and the government takes that property. So we're talking about... In, well, Bacardi wants its, its land back. It wants its Santiago de Cuba back. But the thing is, you think about it, and we talked about how Bacardi sort of like already expanded and built a factory in Mexico, in the Bahamas. What they have in Cuba is not is is not much more than uh, shambles now. Really, the Picardi factory still exists. It still produces rum in Cuba um, for under the Havana Club brand name, but it, it it would it would probably cost them more money to go into Cuba, fix it, build infrastructure, pay people, you know. But it's the image that matters. Exactly. So it's a, it's both the image and the, the sort of name. So they can always be that the Cuban, true Cuban rum, which which is just it's really mind boggling. It is, and I think this is important when we think about um, the history of capitalism. Right, every little thing you consume has interest behind it, whether it's rum, whether it's a book, whether it's even the type of paper you buy, the type of pen you write on. Infamously, as we talk about the history of Microsoft and Apple, the type of computer you use, the type of software you use, the clothes you buy. Apple has that famous uh, imagined in California. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. What does that mean? Well, and the thing is, is that in the modern world, everything you consume, even the most banal thing, 
has to be marketed. Companies have to somehow get people to buy their product. Whether hook or by crook, they have to make that happen. And so every product you buy has a deep history of negotiation, of lobbying, of sometimes, you know, dastardly deeds. And even in the case of Bacardi, Bacardi is not unique in this in this history. It's simply one sort of maybe perhaps exceptional, but in its very nature, it is not itself all that strange. No, and it's funny, just the other day I was eating Chiquita bananas and, <laughs> and they're in partnership with, would you believe it, Star Wars. Either way, like, so you get these random Star Wars stickers on your bananas. And there was a stormtrooper on my banana. I'm thinking how beautiful that Chiquita is pairing with the Empire. It's it's just, this is the story of bananas, And this right? is the story sort of of modern consumerism. Yeah. Is, you know, follow the money. This is sort of the classic ex classic line. And it's always really beneficial whenever you're curious about, like, why do I have a stormtrooper on my banana. But more than that, if you look at, at sort of kids kids um, um, cereals, right? They're always having some sort of movie, some sort of cartoon, right? That doesn't happen by accident, right? You look at the ads on TV. I mean, everything around you, right? Millions of dollars, people's whole careers are devoted to marketing, to ads. And a lot of it, as I think we're seeing with sort of politics today, is the manipulation of information. Absolutely. And the manipulation of information and also like we talk about fake news, but how fake is fake news? Let me give you a couple more Bacardi facts before we get to How total, real is Bacardi? Total consumers. Okay, so we've already established Bacardi's like this multi nut. You're probably drinking rum that's come from sugar from five different countries and been cobbled together in Mexico somewhere. But the <laughs> nothing nothing against Mexico. But in nineteen ninety three, Bacardi uh, acquires general beverage so you might know martini and rossi group they you know it's in it like italian beverage company by 1998 bacardi also acquires Dewar's scotch bombay and bombay sapphire gin okay in 2002 they open a facility in china in 2004 they acquire gray goose in 2007, they acquire a luxury spirit from Brazil, and they have Patron Tequila by 2008. Uh... Bacardi, by 2010, Bacardi owns all of these brands and doers. When you drink a doer's scotch, you think you are in the highlands. You're drinking, you don't think you're drinking Bacardi. No. It's owned by a Cuban American company that's you know sort of deeply entrenched in American politics, fighting for a certain world view, and and under this guise of when you're drinking Patron, you're you know Patron means boss in Spanish. You're you're thinking you know I'm the best. Uh, <laughs> I'm drinking Patron and uh, Mexican tequila, but it, it's part of this giant conglomerate. Yes, but what's interesting with that is the flip side is beer, how as the liquor trade has gotten ever more centralized and sort of bigger and bigger companies taking ever, ever and bigger chunks, beer, microbrew beer and homebrewing beers become such a huge fad. I mean, it's ginormous in the United States. We have more sort of variety of beer and craft beer in the United States than anywhere else in the world and probably at any other time in history. It's really quite astonishing. And which, which is really amazing if you think two of the big beer companies like Anheuser-Busch, um, have they, they just haven't been as politically successful as Bacardi. And one of the things that helps is, is uh, Anheuser-Busch is fighting against American microbrews. This is true. Yeah. yeah, they can't spin it as sort of, hey, we're helping you fight the communists, right? The whole Cold War thing. It's really hard to go to Congress and say we're going to hurt the little guy. Yeah, we're going to go hurt a guy who's making beer in his backyard. Yeah, in because, Minnesota. I mean, I have no doubt that Anheuser-Busch would love to somehow ban... You oh, know, totally. Two um, hearts. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, or sort of say, like, this doesn't pass, like, health code or something. Of course they would, because it cuts in on their business. Right. It is, which is a sound business decision. Probably a poor human decision. But, however, <laughs> from the beginning, right, they've been engaged in sort of nefarious practices. Budweiser beer, right, it's named after a little town, which is now in the Czech Republic, called, in German, Budweiss. Or, in Czech, it's called Budejovice. And it was in this town where they came up with this really damn good beer, right, back in the 19th century. It was like locally very famous, right? It was very well renowned. 
Well, somebody. <laughs> wait, wait, so the, the, you're not talking about St. Louis right now, just no, to be clear. No, 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 no. This is in Czech Republic. But there's an immigrant man, Johan, I think, uh, Bush, uh -huh, comes yeah. over in the 19th century, settles in St. Louis, meets this guy, I think, by the name of Anheuser, and they start a beer company, and they start calling their beer Budweiser beer. They capitalize on the name of this beer that's famous in Central Europe, capitalizing on its renown among Central European and Eastern European immigrant workers to the United States. And but it's totally not that beer. And, and again, <laughs> it's, it's, it's they're just sort of copying the name. They're doing they're they're doing trademarks. They're they're breaking. You know, they're still the trademark even before trademark. And this is just such a great counterpoint to the Bacardi story because in the Bacardi story you have a very powerful multinational who's well versed in American law, sort of fighting for the. Uh, the American rights to call another brand Havana Club or to take the Havana Club name versus Budweiser is, is fighting not a very huge deal. So Budweiser has no problem winning the trademark, right? And, and we still call Budweiser Budweiser. You know, when you're in Czech Republic, people say, I want the real Budweiser. At least that's what Americans say. Yeah. And, and, and you know, that's not going to happen. Good. That's not going to happen with with. Uh, I want the real Bacardi. No, no, because it's not going to happen, especially uh, with relations. So in in 2016, an, an extraordinary thing happens. Uh, President Barack Obama uh, starts this sort of detente with Cuba. He reopens the American embassy, and in 2016. The United States awards the copyright of Havana Club to Cuban government. So the United States recognizes Havana Club as the rightful property of the Cuban government, and uh, Bacardi starts their own Havana Club Puerto Rico. So if you go to a liquor store in the United States, uh, it w it has the same logo, it has the same words, but Bacardi's corporation calls it Havana Club Puerto Rico. It's the official name. So it's legally not violating the trademark that uh, President Obama awarded to the Cuban government, thereby like tacitly recognizing the Cuban government as a real government. Now, we're in 2017 now. Uh, President Trump has and rolled back a lot that happened. has happened. And you can bet the Bacardis are knocking on President Trump's door trying to get him to revoke that copyright. The thing about copyright law is that's not as easy to do as rolling back those travel restrictions. But you can kind of see how this like communism versus capitalism geopolitical battle had a little more power with rum than in beer. Well, this is true. Well, because the beer, Budweiser becomes a big thing in America starting in the 19th century, right? And then, of course, through massive marketing and advertising, it explodes, right? And everyone talks about, you know, give me a Bud, Bud Light, Bud. But well, by I'm but sorry. by the twentieth century, when um, the original, the true, we would say, uh, Budweiser brand beer from Central Europe, from the Czech Republic, wants to start trying to sell its beer in America, it actually attempts to sue Budweiser mm -hmm. um, to claim that they're in violation of copyright law, mm -hmm. and the judge <laughs> tells um, um, the true, I guess, the original um, Budweiser beer company, you can't sue Budweiser. <laughs> Right, you get sue this company because it's been around for over a hundred years now, and it's and it's totally you know synonymous in, in the minds of the American population. Right, Sh they might be breaking laws, but like this is just so water is so much under the bridge that you have no case. You mm -hmm. have no case that I can argue for you because it, the game's over. The jig is up. It's it's and that's just sort of shows the extraordinary power of the American imagination. Once you get an idea inside, it's sort of like how people in the South call all soda Coke. Coke, uh, headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia, entrenches itself in the American imagination as the only type of soda. And, uh, and that's something that sort of persists to today. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's sort of an almost something unique to American brands, their power to become not even just synonymous with their product, but more than that, they become the exemplar of the product. I mean, there's soda and then there's Coke and everyone knows that Coke is the best soda, right? I mean, we're like, we all know there's rum, but then there's Bacardi rum. 
I mean, they, they go beyond just sort of as we were saying earlier about Kleenex, where like Kleenex becomes synonymous with tissues. In that way, Kleenex has almost kind of lost its power because it's become so ubiquitous that people can't differentiate between it and any other product. Whereas American brands in general have this weird ability, whether hook or by crook, to become sort of the leading example of a certain brand. And it's kind of, it's almost... Or a certain product. It's almost comical when they go to war with each other. Uh, Pepsi was one of the biggest supporters of Havana Club Rum. Because... <laughs> Obviously. Yeah, so Pepsi has an inside because Bacardi had spent years making Bacardi and Coke. And, and before, it, Bacardi had not pushed the Cuba Libre thing for years. It, it wasn't until the, the 1990s that Cuba Libre really becomes a thing. Before then, it's always Bacardi and Coke. And, and Pepsi wants in on that. So Pepsi starts to support Havana Club. Havana Club can't ever really establish itself. Um, and, and so you can even see the fault lines as far as that. And so who knew when you're drinking a rum and Coke, you're taking part in a, in a massive sort of brand war of hundreds of millions of dollars waged by these ginormous companies. And and you are essentially... And you are the battleground, right? You, you And not only are you the battleground as far as what you order, but in the words that you say. If you go up and order a Cuba Libre, the bartender might like kind of say, oh, this guy thinks he's cool. If you go up and order a Bacardi and Coke, you know, you're getting a very specific thing. If you just go up and say rum and coke, you know, you're kind of devaluing Bacardi a little bit. If you go up and say rum and Pepsi and the guy says, is coke all right? Say no. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But, but don't be enough. But it's true. Well, yeah, oh, fair, fair. You don't want to, don't, don't make the poor bartender's life miserable. But this is sort of the way and sort of the weird paradox of, of modern life where like the smallest daily purchases you make have so much force behind them. They have so much power behind them. Whereas historically, most people have locally made or locally consumed their products, right? You know, the beer you drink, the be, you know, like the bread you buy, things like this are very local, for mo have been for most of human history. And now though, you have these massive multinational, international brands who are competing for basically the hearts and minds of everybody. Right. And, and in 2014, Bacardi Limited unveils an environmental initiative called Good Spirited, Building a Sustainable Future. And, and that's one of those things where I'm, I'm on the more cynical side of the spectrum, but there's certainly, uh, I mean, yes, it's good that Bacardi even has a program like that. But really, Bacardi now, 2014, has been around 150 years and now they're interested in building a sustainable environment or are they interested in cashing in on that very nice word sustainability? Um, something to consider. As well, in just recently, Hurricane Marina, Mar Maria hits Puerto Rico. Uh, it, it hits Puerto Rico in October and by November 1st, Bacardi's uh, Cathedral of Rum is back up and running with tourist operations. And you ask well, yourself... Whereas the rest of the uh, island is still how's the, how's the rest doing, of the doing quite doing, terrible. Doing quite terrible. And, you, and you'll see all these WAPO articles about Trump is not doing enough in Puerto Rico. That very well may be true. What the hell is Bacardi doing? It does, Bacardi does not care. <laughs> well, I'll be honest. Like Bacardi is, is out for its product, right? right. It's out to produce its product, to get people to go to its factory, to take the tours, and to drink its rum. But in, but Matthias, in 2014, they started Good Spirited Program. But we all know, right, it's that that's, you know. Cool. But this is also the weird essence of, I think, culture and capitalism in the United States, where I currently have in my hand a Starbucks holiday cup, you know, with red and sort of a weird abstract, like, holly plant design, right? Sort of like, it seems kind of Christmassy, but without ever explicitly being Christmas. Thanks, precisely. And the, and it's odd how in the United States this has become an essence of our sort of endless and horrible culture wars, right? Of the war on Christmas, or like companies aren't doing this, or what about this, or you know I don't want to live in a world where Starbucks won't give me my Christmas cup, or something like this. And it's odd how we as Americans sort of move our debates about culture and politics onto the onto the products that we buy and the way our products look and the branding
And, and, and how it feels, like, Math- Matthias, you look better with that red cup. I'm sorry, man. But it, it just, you know, people feel better when they're holding a Starbucks cup. Just like I think people feel better when they go up to the bar and order a rum and Coke. And like, I, is, I mean, personally, I prefer whiskey and Coke. Not, not. There's, just, and there's a whole other podcast we could do about like, the history of Jack Daniels, right? And and what's interesting is whiskey sort of has that legal thing where if it's not in Scotland, it has to have an e in the name, right? If it's not single malt Scottish whiskey, it, it it's it's you know. And then the legal definition of bourbon, and then Kentucky bourbon. Right. There's legal definition, whereas rum never gets that protection. And I think you can trace that into Latin American history, the way in which Latin America has sort of been used as this like destination for uh, product, for producing sugar, for producing tobacco, for producing all kinds of things for North America um, versus Scotland, who has sort of consumed their own whiskey and it's kind of protecting it. In, in fact, just the other day, we were drinking a, a nitro IPA, which which would have violated all sorts of laws in Germany under their... their this is true. Germany prides itself on being like the homeland of true beer. Right when we th- and of course it, it because it's also part of the cultural image right when we think of Germany we think of you know Oktoberfest and steins and you know and beer halls and you know prost and but that means they have to make sure that they protect sort of that image by also protecting their beer yeah so you're not real beer yeah they have very strict laws I think by law the only thing that can count as beer in Germany is I think water yeast hops and that is it you're missing one ingredient sugar no water yeast hops oh man i don't brew my own beer what wheat we? wheat oh obviously yeah, uh, yeah 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 i knew that all along. four ingredients that's all it takes to make beer but that is but you can't have more than that no and so nitro ipa is you're all, messing with it right yeah. you're doing something to it it's that not makes real it, beer it's unnatural but this is also why in germany right like flavored beers or kind of that whole like like the like the hard root beer thing we have going on in the states not allowed doesn't exist crazy flavored beers like we're gonna throw in like some oranges we're gonna throw in like some this some of that no since we're getting to like the rundown the dying embers of this hour of history I want to really hit home on this last I this is like we've really been in this last few months this last year in conversations about nationalism and let's tie these spirits into nationalism, these beers, these alcohols. Um, what, what, is there really a tie between alcohol and national? Can't we just drink whatever? <laughs> well, well, no, Steve, because, right, I mean, if you, if you have a rum and coke, no one's gonna think badly of you, you have a Bacardi, right. but if you have some sort of other drink, Right, there's all kind of we what, what if I have absinthe? What are people going to think of me? I mean, they might think like, oh, look at this pretentious hipster. Right? <laughs> but more than that, it's also sort of like, you know, the brands we buy. Or we think of like Stolichnaya, right? Vodka. Yeah. Um, I mean... So you... what's the image? I'm not thinking of a Belizean farmer when, when I think of Stolichnaya. No, you think of like Russia and... And and is this tied to nationalism? It's tied to nationalism. It is, or like sort of our national stereotypes of other countries, which we usually filter through like what they drink and what they eat. And how how helpful is that? I mean, not at all, because (laughs) (laughs) I mean, well, because if we looked at it right, you know, Bacardi wants to be like, yeah, we're like the Caribbean, Puerto Rican rum, but really, like these big multinational corporations, just by their very like definition, have no loyalty to particular nations outside of whether the populations in those nations buy their product. Yeah. Um, and so we look at that again through like say Anheuser-Busch or you know through Bacardi, right? Now maybe Anheuser-Busch has sort of a certain stake in America because it's so intertwined with like sort of American identity. Didn't they but if rename they, their beer America this summer? I think did they, they did, not? yeah, yeah. But I think if they thought that they could like open up a new market somewhere else, they wouldn't hesitate. If they, if they could get away with it. So, I, I, numerous times... Well, I, I was, okay, I agree with you on that. I think that it does not matter to these companies. It does not matter to the man. You know, Don Facundo Bacardi be damned. I think his family would be just... I'm sorry, Bacardi family. 
I hope I don't get assassinated by like the CIA later tonight. But I'm sure the Bacardi family, God rest Don Facundo Bacardi's name, most blessed, um, they wouldn't care as long as they're rolling in cash. No, no. And so I think it's this odd sort of paradox of the modern world where we have sort of almost increased stereotypes, sort of increased kind of nationalist notions of like, these people are like this, we're like this, blah, 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 right? Like we do these things. And yet the products by which, and sort of the types of food and drink by which we sort of, you know, use the scaffolding to put like our images of other people on are, you know, totally all over the place as we were talking about with like tax havens, right? Even the Queen of England doesn't do her taxes in England no, anymore. No, stop. She's not <laughs> paying for her no, own people. Yeah. And so it's this really weird thing where, you know, we associate um, your, right, or like maybe, what's another great case example? Like maybe like Wrangler or something or yeah. Levi's, right, as jeans, like America. But like I, they all make their clothes. Like we all know they have sweatshops in yeah, East Asia. Yeah, totally. My, or Nike is associated very much with like American athleticism. A big yet, one in the news lately was Boeing versus Airbus. And, and Boeing and Airbus both make planes and you know people get in fights like i see them on facebook saying oh i like the boeing it's an american made plane it's so comfortable the airbus has terrible seats airbus and boeing both have seats that are made in germany or also, or yeah or sort of the weird funny paradox right is is donald trump right right now is in his, his asia tour and he just was in japan he just said the most incredible thing that japan should make more cars in america when in reality, because we think of like, oh, Toyota cars are killing the American economy. Right. Hyundai. Drive America. Drive, yeah. But they already do. Japan already makes most of its cars in the United States, right? These sort of economic problems are sort of in a lot of people's heads, right? <laughs> we just sort of associate like, oh, these Japanese cars and their newfangled ways when they're already made in the United States. It's potentially in my head because I've been drinking Bermudan rum that's <laughs> labeled as Puerto Rico's <laughs> finest Cuban rum. <laughs> I know, and so I think it's odd, and I don't think it's, well, not odd, but I don't think it, it's, um, actually, I should say it's not surprising. It's, it's not, not odd, odd that you see people doubling down on certain kind of nationalist cultural identities in a world where things are so dispersed, right? In a world where, where all of our products, you know, don't really have a national local identity anymore, right? right. They're We're sort of so created global. by international global companies. And so I think it's almost in a weird way a kind of existential, perhaps, you know, self-defense mechanism or a kind of psychological response is people want certainties. And so I think it's no accident that in a globalized world, the most mega globalized moment in human history, people are starting to double down on these sort of, you know, nationalist visions to say this is who we are and this is how we operate. I, 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 yeah, and, and I totally fell prey to this. Just last week, I was going to a dinner. I picked up a bottle of wine, and I thought I was being cheeky. I got a Catalonian wine. But, it, uh, but hey, 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 hold on. It wasn't from Catalonia, the Spanish Catalonia, although it would have been respectful of me to support their economy and this independence struggle, unless I'm pro-Spain. I'm not going to divulge political information here. God, no. But in, I bought a French Catalonian wine, and I sort of made a joke about it because there's French Catalonia as well, but their history goes back further. They've been French longer. They don't speak Catalan. They speak French. Anyway, so I bring it in, and I say, aha, Catalonian wine, but from good Catalonia, who has not rebelled. I made a whole joke of it, and, you know, we were laughing. Aha, they'll always be part of France because, uh, as Eugene Weber has said in Peasants into Frenchmen, one of the best history books ever written, you know, he sort of traces how the French get that national identity. The Catalans are taken in on that. Little do I know, the next day I checked the news and the French Catalans have <laughs> also marched for independence <laughs> in support of the... Of Spanish Catalonia. Yeah. So, so here I thought I was buying this nationalist wine. I thought I was supporting not a movement, but a country. I thought I was supporting France rather than the nationalist movement, but it turns out to be all nonsense. And I'm sure if I read that label closer, it was probably packaged by a California wine company, probably owned by the Bacardi Corporation. Probably, in some way. 
<laughs> well, what's fascinating too is if you look at the history of the Cold War, particularly um, if you read accounts of people behind, like in the Eastern Bloc and the Iron Curtain. Um, there's like such a kind of like a fetish for like American products, like Western products. There's sort of this almost magical image that you know, you know, Coke, like Coke and Levi's, or like some sort of like 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 you know from another planet almost. You know, and so to be good. like and to be like a true hip, you know, modern human. Those are the things you have to have. And it's odd how after the Cold War in America, we now associate like our sort of glitz and luxury with European products, right? We think of like Rolls Royce and Lamborghini. Yeah. Or we think of like really fancy clothes. We think of like Gucci, right? We think of like, you know, or like British brands. Like we think of these very fancy, ritzy products as c coming from Europe. And that, and that American products are somehow kind of like staid or boring. But again, that's also an illusion because those products are not really, you know, they're huge and multinational now. Right, yeah, and you know, you're you're having a car. If you're gonna buy a Lamborghini, it's probably designed and yeah, it's that it just goes back to that Apple. Imagine or or, to, or like for instance, Chevy and Ford, right? People literally put up those. You see those stickers, right? Of like um, Calvin, Cal, from Calvin and Hobbes, like pissing on like a certain brand, like you know, like <laughs> right. Usually, people pissing. are so proud yeah. of their brands. People are so proud of their brands, and the thing is, it's like. It, and it's and it's brilliant the way that ad people have have been able to figure this out that if you can inspire brand loyalty, you know that's that's it right you you've got people it's almost as if people are give more loyalty to their brands now than almost to anything else in their lives right people yeah. get more upset over like the type of phone you use are you a Samsung you and I yeah yeah then perhaps even other political issues and I think this is also something that's really fascinating about life in America and not just life in America but but global life in the last probably what 50 60 years is just the enormity of the influence of sort of global capitalism and brands yeah and I'm sure that this global capitalism this branding issue um, is is going to be something that comes up uh, on our discussions in the future we just want to remind you that this episode was brought to you by Bacardi, sponsored by Coke, <laughs> and, and a partner with the, Marco Rubio, <laughs> CIA, the C and the, the CAMF, University of Miami, if you're listening, I would love to go down and do research in your Cuban Institute. <laughs> I hear it's wonderful, fully funded by the Bacardi family. I'll leave you with this. Bacardi has a bat on, well, let's start even earlier. Lamborghini has a model called the Murcielago. The Murcielago, you know, that's bat. It means bat. Um, Bacardi has a bat on its label. The Bacardi, the story they told me at Cathedral de Bacardi was that the bat is a symbol of family. It was a symbol of family back in Spain. and. Regardless of how Bacardi has treated Cuba, how they've treated Bahamas, Mexico, Bermuda, North America, Miami, New York, they've always had a Bacardi run their corporation. So in this world in which pride and nationalism takes over family, family, I will say congratulations, Bacardi, <laughs> you've kept your empire whether it be evil or benevolent i'm not going to make a decision because i don't want to be assassinated you've kept it in the family and for that i think everyone can applaud you which is more almost like mafia Costa Nostra. <laughs> okay i was trying to end on a positive <laughs> note matthias but boo no but anyway thanks for tuning in and uh at 58 minutes and 39 seconds this is your hour of history have a good one